Hey folks, welcome back to Earth Sky. And today we're on the hunt for the elusive Planet Nine. And joining us is Caltech's Mike Brown. He's an astrophysicist. This guy right here has discovered 30 minor planets, including Eris. Well, plus or minus. I'm going with 30. And Eris is uh, an icy world way the heck out beyond Pluto. We thought for a while it was bigger than Pluto, but it tells us that Pluto isn't more massive than Pluto. That's what it I'm is thinking. more massive than Pluto. Okay. And so last time you were here, uh, you told us about a model that you and Constantin Batigan introduced in, in 2016 that shows there should be a planetary body as big as Neptune, maybe as big as Neptune out in the far reaches. Uh, this is the so-called planet nine. You're still hunting for us. What can you tell us about it? How's the hunt coming? Give us an update. Well, so the, the hunt, one of the, it's, it's like one of these things where the hunt is always terrible until the, you day, the day you find it. And then it's fabulous. So we haven't found it. So currently the hunt is terrible, um, but we have we have good hope for the next year. So um, I, I think that uh, if Planet Nine is going to be found soonish, it will be found in the next year, year and a half. So I'm, I'm pretty excited. Wow, that's coming right up. So you've got uh, some pretty good evidence. Let's let's go over here. You've got some pretty good evidence for where it might be. And this is. An interpretation of that. Tell us, can you tell us what we're looking at here, Mike? Yeah, this is one of the the very earliest lines of evidence that there's something out there. It's it's looking at the orbits of the most distant objects in the Kuiper Belt, this region of space beyond Neptune, and the most distant objects go on these very elongated orbits, and then they come back in. And here, the the picture of the the first ones we noticed that seemed a little bit strange are really just these six right here. And if you look at these six even without knowing anything about them, you might wonder why those six are all pointing off to the left instead of mm. being distributed all the way around the sky. And that was that was really the first question that we started asking ourselves. We, we again, as it's me and uh, Constantine Batygin, and we, we looked at these and we thought, you know, the easy solution is that there's a big planet out there causing this, but everybody knows there's not another planet out there. That would be dumb. So we spent like a year trying to come up with other ideas, looking at other gravitational influences. And in the end, we, we, were, we were left with that a planet is really the only thing that can, uh, that can uh, explain the, the, uh, the orbits of these objects out there in the outer solar system. Okay, so it has to be, according to the models, it has to be a singular body someplace between mass of Earth and the mass of Neptune, right? That we're That's talking right. about. Okay. I mean, has to be a singular. Like it could be, it could be two bodies going around each other. We, it's the gravitational resolution is not good enough to say that there can't be, a, you know, moons or big moons or something. But basically, it's a planet. It's about midway between Earth and Neptune in mass. Okay. So you said that was an early image of the orbits that you were finding out there. I that kind of implies you found more. What else have you found since 2016 in that that look? One of the the obvious predictions of our of our hypothesis that there's a planet out there um, is that we will, as we continue to find more and more distant objects in the outer solar system they will continue to show this pattern where they all go off to one side. And indeed, this is what's happened. Um, so we've, we've come, I think we've more than doubled the number of these objects. And if the objects get too close to, to Neptune, Neptune kind of swings them around and we have to ignore them. But the ones that don't come close to Neptune are all pushed off to one side, just, just like we would predict. And again, there's kind of no other explanation that anybody's been able to come up with that makes any other sense. And so I, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that a planet is what's doing it out there. A planet. Okay. So when we say a planet, we've got this, this guy right here. This is a R Hertz interpretation of a Neptune like body far away from its parent star. And you're, it doesn't have to be, you said it doesn't have to be a singular planet. It could, what, what kind of body is it? Is it a gas giant? Is it a rocky planet? Is it yeah, something? Yeah. So 
What is it? Good question. And the answer is, we don't know. Um, and more importantly, we have no way to know. So right now, what we see is the gravitational effect of this planet. And it is something like seven times the mass of the Earth. So we see, we see that things are being tugged by something with seven times the mass of the Earth. But what that is, we don't know. We have no way of knowing until we actually see it. It could be a, a big Neptune-like planet with a, with a gaseous atmosphere. It could be a huge ice ball. It could be uh, a giant cat. You know, we, we can't tell anything other than the fact that it's seven times the mass of the Earth. Now, that doesn't stop us from telling stories about what we think is going on out there. And, and I think the most likely scenario is that it's a small version of Neptune rather than a big version of the Earth or a big version of, of Ganymede or something. And so it's so I think if you looked at it, it's going to have a icy rocky core surrounded by a hydrogen helium envelope of atmosphere. And that's why when, when uh, Bob Hurt uh, did this picture, he basically made it kind of look like Neptune. We actually don't think anymore that it would be blue. We think it actually might be quite white. But at the time we thought, ah, Neptune, it should be blue, maybe have clouds. Um, probably too cold for either of those, but but still a Neptunish like planet. A Neptunish like planet. So maybe something like this, lighter in color, but it could be anything until we get out there and see it for ourselves. Yeah. Including that giant purple teapot that I've heard might be orbiting out there, but nobody could can be disprove. True. Could be. Okay, but you suspect that it's probably something more along the lines of, of this guy right here. Okay, that makes sense to me. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, so how? How are you searching for Where are you looking? Are you using telescopes or citizen scientists involved? Who's doing this job with you? Who's helping you out here? Yeah, so so the the way to find it remains the way that planets have been found since Herschel found the first planet, which is that you see something in the sky, you come back the next day or the next week or the next month, and it's in a different spot, and you have found something. That remains the way that that uh, everything we find in this in the solar system is found, and so we're still doing it with optical telescopes. You know, your regular big telescope that you uh, just open up the dome and look at the night sky. And, and we've been doing this for, for many years now and tried many different things. The, the first thing we did actually was to refine our theory so we knew where to look instead of wasting all the telescope time. When we did that, we, we came up with a swath of the sky that the, the planet orbits through. And so we know we have this, this swath of sky that's about, it's about this big on the sky. Um, but it goes all the way around the sky. We don't know where in that swath it is. So it's still a pretty big area to look in. We also um, used our, our calculations to figure out how big and bright it might be. There's a big range. Um, so it could be as bright as, as being able to be seen in like a really high-end amateur telescope. I don't think it's that bright because I think somebody would have found it by now. Or it could be on the much fainter end. But so what we started doing is using old surveys that people have done that look over big areas of the sky. So we use this survey that's done here at Palomar Observatory called, uh, called ZTF, the Zwicky Transient Facility that basically takes pictures of the sky night after night after night. And we looked to see if there was anything we could connect with Planet 9. We did the same thing with another survey, PanStar survey. And that's really the right way to do it, use these other big surveys. We're looking forward to, and the reason I said that I think this is gonna happen soon. We're looking forward to the opening of the Vera Rubin Observatory, which is, I have to say, if, if you were to hand me a billion dollars, seems like a good idea, hand me a billion dollars and say, build a telescope to go find Planet Nine. I would, I would actually hand you that billion dollars back and say the Vera Rubin Observatory is already that telescope. It's absolutely perfect. It's gonna just take pictures of the sky night after night after night. And we just need to find that one faint objects slowly moving across the sky. Wow. That's just a thrill. It's coming. So you're thinking a year, year and a half in that range. What, what I'll say is if, if it's on the moderate to brighter end of our predictions, Vera Rubin will find it. It is possible that it's a little too far away and a little too faint, even for Vera Rubin. But, but I would say there's a, there is a not bad chance that it's found in the next year and a half. 
how far out is it? What might it be? Yeah, so our, our typical distances we think of is about 600 astronomical units, which is 20 times further than Neptune. So this is this is way the heck out there. When we talk about the Kuiper belt and Pluto, we're talking about things that come almost into the orbit of Neptune or even cross the orbit of Neptune and maybe go from 30 astronomical units to maybe 40, maybe even 50. And this is 600. Okay, we're dealing with a whole different scale then. This is well beyond Pluto, yeah. way, way, way out there. And so this brings us to other astronomers, other astrophysicists are out there looking too. And there was a team, yeah. Taiwanese team, last month that said they have a candidate, the Planet Nine candidate, but they're looking in the wrong place, like Indiana Jones said. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't say they're looking in the wrong place. I think okay. the right thing, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great paper. What they did is they, they uh, looked at old data from the IRAS satellite in 1983, I think it was. And then another satellite, 23 years later, the Akari satellite, um, both of these mapped out big regions of the sky in the infrared. And... If, it's, if there's a planet out there, you might see it in one data set and then in a different spot in the other data set. Now, what that really means is that you have to look through the entire sky. You have to compare the IRAS data to the Akari data and say, for every single object, oh, was it there? Was, was it in this one and this one? If it's, if it's in the same place twice, it's not real. So they found one object that was in the IRAS data set and not in the Akari data set, and then where there was one in the Akari data set and not in the IRAS data set. And they were close enough together that if you fit an orbit to them, they could plausibly be at the distance of planet nine. This is the right thing to do. The right thing to do is to not is to, is to ignore our predictions and just go out and look. That said, the, the, the thing that they found, if it's real, it's, it's not something that would make those patterns in the sky that we saw. It's actually a planet that is, it's tilted, not even just 90 degrees to the sun, but like 120 degrees to the sun, um, which doesn't mean it's impossible. It just means it's not the thing that's causing these effects in the sky. Now, the, the, the obvious question really is, is it even real? And it's a tough one to answer. So when, when we do these surveys, um, looking at old surveys, like I said, the ZTF and the pan stars, we can always find a few objects that match an orbit, like a few detections that match an orbit like planet nine. And then when we finally get to maybe six or seven data points, they all disappear because it's not real. It's just little blips in the sky. So two, I, I probably would not believe anything that just had two data points without seeing a third and a fourth and maybe a fifth and a sixth. But it's still, it's it's a it's a survey worth doing. It's worth looking to see what might be out there. And it's a tantalizing result. There might be something there. They might be right, but we're going to need more data. I think is what you're what yeah, you're saying. Yeah, I mean, so so in, until somebody goes and takes pictures of of something like that today, which Vera Rubin will, it'll cover that area of the sky where it would be. It would probably be able to see something that faint, and so we will be able to answer those questions coming pretty soon, I believe. Ooh, boy, this is an exciting time to be yeah. in astronomy and be watching the sky. That's great. Speaking of exciting times, anything else exciting? I know you're mainly focused on Planet Nine right now. You got anything else in the works? Or you? I, so, you, you book. You you got a you got a a, a sequel coming out to uh, the Man um, Who Killed Blue and White? Here's my, here's my book. I, like I, like I have one right here on my desk because of course I do. show it to us. There it there is. It is. Uh, How I killed Pluto. And I even have you know, it bookmarks in it of things I like to read. Um, so, so that was a fun book for for uh, you know telling the story of the discovery of Eris and and how Pluto got demoted. And I mean, if we end up finding Planet Nine, I think that makes a fun book. So I've I, I, that's in the back of my head of things I might do if uh, if when Planet Nine gets discovered. Um, in the meantime, actually, the other fun thing going on in the sky in astronomy is is really the James Webb Space Telescope. And so my, my graduate students and I are spending a lot of time looking at basically every 
icy body beyond Jupiter that we can get our hands on and trying to understand what these new data from James Webb are telling us. And it's just, it's, it's just, you just get to see things that you could never see before. And by things to me, I'm really interested in spectroscopy, trying to understand the compositions, trying to look at when the light hits that object, what wavelengths get absorbed and which reflect back, which tells you what things are made out of. So that's what we're looking at. I don't think I ever look at images from James Webb, but we look at just beautiful spectra and are learning all kinds of interesting things. That's that's fantastic. It's just fascinating, fascinating it's stuff that you're fun. doing. Mike, thanks for the great interview. And we're going to get you back as soon as we get Planet Nine located. We're going to have all right. you back. And, 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 Think of a good name. I know you don't name them until after you find exactly. them, right? Yeah. yeah Bad luck to think about names before you name them, but before you find them. But as soon as we find it, send those suggestions. All right. Send your suggestions. As soon as we have Planet Nine, Mike is looking for a new name. I am going to hide you backstage, hang around, and I'm going to tell these folks what's coming up. Hang on, Mike. I'll be right back backstage. Hey, guys. Thanks for joining us. If you got anything out of that, hit like, hit subscribe. And remember, we're here, we are here at the same time, which is 1715 Universal Time Coordinate, UTC, every weekday. And on Friday, which is tomorrow, we have a fascinating look at ancient Egyptian cosmology and why the goddess Newt might be the Milky Way. Anyway, come check that out. We'll see you tomorrow. I hope one earth, one sky, earth sky. <laughs>